Thank you, Pastor Mitchner, for leading us in communion. Bridgeway, it's always a great day when I get to come back and be a part of a wonderful ministry that God has created and used so many of you to help do that. Wonderful to be back from my sabbatical, refreshed and, and ready to lead the charge in our next ministry year. And this is a very special ministry year because it's our 30th year of public ministry. What an amazing landmark for Bridgeway Community Church. In fact, on September 12th, our, our ministry kickoff year where we give you new bands with new themes, well, guess what? We're going to do it again this ministry year, and September the 12th is going to be our Vision Sunday, and we're going to talk about what the vision and what the theme is for our 30th year anniversary. I sure hope that you will be with us in fact, if you're in Columbia, our Columbia campus, our plan is that we will open on September 12th as well. So get yourself ready for that. Mark your calendars. Of course, we're not sure everything with the Delta variant and with the building, but we're pretty close to having the building renovated on the first phase. And so, Lord willing, it'll be ready by then. If it's not, guess what we might do? You have to have been around here for about 15 years because 15 years ago in 2006, we were in the parking lot of Columbia, Maryland's Red Branch campus in a tent. And for four or five weeks, we worshiped in a tent before our building was ready. And then we went into the building and we consecrated it. Well, maybe, just maybe, that's going to happen again. We'll be in a tent for a few weeks and then we'll go in and consecrate the new uh, building renovations. We'll see. Stay uh, connected. Remember, online you can get our uh, campus email. If you're not getting that email, go to uh, bridgeway.cc and make sure you sign up for the email so you can know what's going on. I'm really uh, very thankful for the seven or eight weeks I've been away uh, just visioning and vacationing and, and being able to log in online and to watch on my phone or wherever I was throughout that time period, uh, watching and learning and worshiping. And so I just want to say a hearty thank you to all those that served and volunteered behind the cameras, behind the knobs of technology, as well as the worship ministry, the creative arts ministry, and all those who have been serving in so many different capacities, especially at OMR with the parking ministry and so much going on now that we're doing live in-person services here in uh, the Owens Mills Reisterstown campus as well, so thank you. And then to my clergy who have preached and taught and brought the word over the last couple of months. Thank you. I've seen all of your messages, and I'm so grateful for how you minister in person in Owens Mills as well as through our broadcast service. It's just amazing to have such a great ministry team. Maybe you want to be a part of that ministry team and volunteer, become a champion at Bridgeway Community Church by using your gifts and talents to serve the body, whether it's in the parking lot, whether it's in Bridge Kids, whether it's uh, singing or behind the cameras, whatever it takes, you have talents and you have gifts. And over this next ministry year, we need you. All right. And so whether you are vaccinated or unvaccinated, if you're unvaccinated, wear a mask. If you're not vaccinated, you have the option to wear a mask or not. But guess what? We all have the ability to serve. And so I want you to uh, go to our website, check out the link that's on your screen right now or go to bridgeway.cc and just say, I want to serve. All right. And let's help you find a match. So over this next year, you can help us move the ball forward in ministry. You got it? Now, let me just ask you for a little poll here. Uh, if we do open on September 12th with all the protocols and everything, will you come or will you not come? Write in the chat, yes or no or not yet, all right? Just write in the chat. Let's see. Let's do a little informal poll on Facebook and on YouTube. Yes, I'll be there, Pastor, in Columbia, Maryland, September 12th, Owens Mills, Maryland, September 12th, or no, not yet, not sure, going to sit back and wait. Hey, there's no shame in your game. I'm not judging you. I just kind of uh, want to know, okay? But for those who do come, I'm going to give each person $1,000, so you make your choice, okay? Of course, that's a joke. All right. Just to be sure. So we'll see the motivations for some people showing up uh, again. I want to thank the clergy. Also, you know, some things happened this summer, like uh, Dante and Stephen and Tori and Pastor Sandy were all holed up in the ladies room, as you can see on that picture together. I'm still not quite sure about that, but hey, I'll never forget. We'll pray about that as well. Just glad they made it out. And of course, if you don't know what that picture is about, then uh, check out Pastor Sandy's message last week where she preached about the Holy Spirit. 
and we're going to ask the Holy Spirit to be with us right now in this sermon. Are you ready now that my opening comments are done? Let's see how we're doing on time. All right, you ready to get into the Word? Get your Bible, get your notebook, get your coffee, whatever it takes. Get your mind and your heart ready because I'm going to come at you from the Word of God in a brand new four-week series called I Saw Esau. All right? And today's message, hold on to your birthright. Next week, take hold of your blessing. The following week, let go of your bitterness. And then the last week of this four-week series, fight for your breakthrough. Birthright, blessing, bitterness, breakthrough. Let's pray. Now, God, as we go into your word, we pray that your word would go into us. Teach us from the scriptures in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. I say get your Bibles out or click it on your phone. We're going to Genesis 25. We're going to read from verses 21 to 34, and I'm going to introduce you to a guy named Esau. You may know of the story of Jacob and Esau. Let's pick it up at verse 21 from the NIV, the New International Version, 1984. This is what it says. Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was barren. The Lord answered his prayer. And his wife, Rebecca, became pregnant. The babies jostled each other within her. And she said, why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord. The Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb. And two peoples from within you will be separated. One people will be stronger than the other. And the older will serve the younger. When the time came for her to give birth, there were Twin boys in her womb. The first came out, was, the first to come out was red, and his whole body was like a hairy garment. So they named him Esau, which means red or, or hairy. After this, they named, after this, his brother came out with his hand grasping Esau's heel, so he was named Jacob, which means to grasp the heel or deceiver. Isaac was 60 years old and Rebecca gave birth, uh, when Rebekah gave birth to them. The boys grew up and Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of the open country, while Jacob was a quiet man staying among the tents. Isaac, who had a taste for wild game, loved Esau and Rebekah loved Jacob. So dad was fond of his firstborn Boy, Esau, mom was fond of the second twin, Jacob. Verse 29, once when Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau came in from the open country, famished. He said to Jacob, quick, let me have some of the, that red stew. I'm famished. This is why he was also called Edom, which again is red. Jacob replied first. Sell me your birthright. Look, I'm about to die, Esau said. What good is the birthright to me? But Jacob said, swear to me first. So he swore an oath to him, selling his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and some lentil stew. He ate and drank and then got up and left. So Esau despised his birthright. Don't allow your appetite to rob you of your birthright. May God take the word and move it to a place of understanding in our hearts, our minds, and our spirit. So we have Jacob and Esau, twins, in the womb. Esau comes out first. Jacob grasping to his heel. What do we know? We know that, that Esau was the older twin. We know that he was hairy and he was, he was red. So maybe we'll just call him Dirty Harry. He was skilled and he was a hunter and he was out in the open country and, and, and working hard to gain food. He was loved and favored by his dad, but he comes in after working in the open country and it says that he was famished from hunting. 
It says in verse 30, Genesis 25, 30, quick, let me have some of that red stew. I am famished. Then you have Jacob, right? Jacob's the younger twin. He's staying at home. He's the chef. He's the one doing the cooking. He's whipping up that stew. He probably knew that his brother was going to be hungry. You know how it is. You can draw people with a smell when you're a chef. And while he came out of the womb grasping to his brother's heel, we learn that Jacob's name means deceiver or grasping of the heel. He was a deal maker. He was opportunistic. And his brother, when he came in from all of that work, was famished. Have you ever been famished? Not hungry. Famished. What a word. Definition of famished. Extremely hungry. Intensely hungry. Or according to the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, to suffer or cause to suffer extreme hunger. Starve. Starve to death. Like you've got to eat. Let me ask you, what is this? What is this? Can I tell you what this is? This is a bag of pretzels. Yes, that's right. I was flying in town this week, and guess what they served me as a meal? Pretzels. This was my meal, and when you take economy airlines, guess what you're going to get for a meal? Pretzels. This was it. And not just a pathetic bag of pretzels, but a pathetic bag, look on your screen if you can see it, of mini pretzels. They couldn't even give me big pretzels. Now, in order to understand the feeling of my hunger that day, is I knew that I had to get up early, check out from the hotel. I knew I had to return the rental car, and I did. And I thought about eating, like, when should I eat? I said, you know what I'll do? Instead of taking time to eat breakfast at the hotel, I'm going to leave early enough so I can go return the rental car, take the shuttle to the airport, and then find, get all through security, and then find myself a nice place where I can get some food. Like, when I get to the terminal, I'll eat in the restaurant, and I'll just sit there and have a, a nice meal. So that was the plan. I do all of the uh, planning, I get myself there, I take my, my bags, I turn in the rental car, I, I go through security, I finally do that long, long walk in this airport, and finally I get to my terminal. And sometimes it takes a while to get to a terminal. It's never the terminal that's closest once you go through security, is it? It's always that terminal that's all the way down there. But that's all right. I'm not stressed. I have time. Then I get an alert on my phone. Your flight has been delayed. OK, I have even more time, all right? So I get to my terminal, and guess what? There's only one restaurant. It's a bar restaurant. It's small, and it has line of, a line of people. There are no other places in this big old airport. But in this terminal, one restaurant. Oh, well, what am I going to do? Got to eat. and. It was delayed by a couple of hours. So if I don't eat now and then I get on that flight and they give me a wonderful scrumptious meal for a three hour flight, we're looking at about seven to eight hours of eating nothing. And I didn't have breakfast at the hotel. So I'm going to stand in line. I'm going to find my seat. And sure enough, someone got up from the bar. I went to the bar, got the last seat at the end of the bar, and I'm like, yes, I'm going to order me some food. This brother is going to eat because I'm hungry. Maybe not famished, but the brother's hungry. And my wife and I have kind of been on a health kick. You know, she's doing so well, looking so good, losing all this weight. So I said, baby, I'm going to be supportive. So about four months ago, I said, I'm going to be supportive. I'm not going to eat any carbs or any sugars, maybe some little sugar, in the house. No desserts, no cookies, no bread. I'm just going to be eating meat. This brother can eat some meat. Check out my Instagram. This big old piece of meat I had when I was in Miami, absolutely amazing. They do this little salt bay thing where the salt's on the meat, all of that. Way too expensive. It didn't taste like the money, but it still was good, right? Okay, so I'm good. Let me get something, a salad. Maybe I'll get some, some chicken on the side. Maybe I'll get a, a little steak if they have it or a fish taco, you know, something like that, right? Check it out. The guy gives me a menu, not the kind that open up. It's just like one piece of paper. They only have three items. Really two, if you think about it. But they made it as three. A hamburger, number one. A cheeseburger, number two. Still a hamburger with cheese. And then number three, a chicken sandwich. 
on a brioche me, uh, bun. So I'm like, I haven't had a burger in like four months. I don't want to do it now, but that's all they have. A burger or a chicken sandwich. That's it. One, two, or three. Which one would you like? Whew. Well, what would you do? Well, I'll tell you what I did just a little bit later in the sermon. But let's get back to Esau, who must have been famished. He smelled that soup. His appetite was stronger than his ability to analyze anything well. His hunger was stronger than his head. And Esau's brother Jacob took advantage of his brother's weak condition and swindled him, making him a deal that he could not refuse. So Jacob says to his famished brother first in verse 31, sell me your birthright. What was Jacob after? His brother's birthright. Now, what is a birthright? It is really the right to be recognized as the firstborn. All the benefits that come with it, including uh, the, the inheritance, the, the leadership of the family, the judicial authority of the father. The birthright right was legally and rightfully Esau's as the firstborn, but Esau traded it for something lesser. He traded a greater positional and lasting value for something that was temporary and fleeting in its value in order to satisfy his appetite. It sounds like some of the choices you and I make, doesn't it? Whether it's our physical appetites or our sexual or emotional appetites or even the appetites of our temper to release a flood of anger upon another. We make choices to satisfy our temporary desires instead of fighting for the more lasting and eternal values. So what I want to do from this story is to give you three life lessons from Esau that will help you hold on to that which is rightfully yours. Three life lessons from Esau that will help you hold on to that which is rightfully yours. Number one, beware of weasels in your way. Beware of weasels in your way. There are people who want what you have, but they're not willing to work for it. Instead, they weasel for it. You want what I have without having to go through what I went through. You want to go around everything I had to go through to get what I have. And what happens is weasels don't want to work for what you have. They just want to weasel for what you have. They want the benefits of your life without going through the burdens you've had to carry. So you've got to beware of weasels in your way. People want a ministry of thousands without the blood and the sweat and the tears it took to get here. Some folks want the crown. They just don't want to go through the cross. And here's the thing. They're more than happy to let you bear your crown and bear your cross. And when you're going through your cross, they're more than happy to let you struggle with it alone. But then when you get your crown, they want to be down. They come around. They want to hang out with you. You see, there are workers and then there are weasels. Jacob wasn't a worker. Oh, but God would make him one later. I'll tell you how he had to work for some, somebody he loved. I'll tell you that later in another sermon. But I'll tell you, when people are weasels, they don't want to do the work that's necessary to get what they truly want. There are Jacobs in your life. There are Jacobs, weasels, deceivers in your life. There are Jacobs that will grasp onto your heel. That's what Jacob means, grasping the heel. They will, they will ride your coattails. They will hang on to your heel and then try to make their own deal. Everybody's got a side hustle. Ain't nothing wrong with the side hustle. In fact, I like side hustles. Just be honest about them. I take people on ministry trips all the time, but I remember I took a group of people and there was one person in the group Every time they had an opportunity, they were working their side hustle. Thing about it is they weren't honest about it. Look, 
If you got a deal going on, tell me. I'm going to help you get it. I'm going to provide for you an opportunity to even pitch what you have. But to kind of do it on the side and act like I'm not going to hear about it, people are faithful. People will tell you. One time I went to this major national event, and there was somebody, again, working a side hustle. They got found out and caught, and they've never been on another ministry trip with me. What's my point? Nothing wrong with the side hustle, but be open and honest about it. Don't be a Jacob. And can I tell you, those of you who are listening to me today, some Jacobs in your life can actually be, I hate to say it, family members. This was Esau's brother. Not just his brother, his twin brothers. Usually twins are thick as thieves. <laughs> They'd be wearing the same thing, sound alike, impersonate each other when they're dating. I mean, a whole lot of stuff go on between twins. Like, this was brother-to-brother twinship. Can I tell you, some family members can't be trusted. They will offer you something that will cost you more than you want to pay and keep you longer than you want to stay. And so as we learn life lessons, learn this first one. Beware of the weasels in your way. But here's a second lesson. Are you ready? Write it down. Be fierce, fearlessly or fiercely committed to what's first. Be fiercely committed to what's first. Jacob used the word first twice in verse 31 and in verse 33. Listen to what he says. Jacob says, first, sell me your birthright. He says in verse 33, swear to me first. So he swore an oath to him, selling the birthright to Jacob. You see, if God is first in your life, then you've got to be fiercely committed to him with your living and with your giving because Many people will come your way and try to become first or sell you something first. And Jesus says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these other things will be added unto you. Jesus wants to be first. We always have time for what's first. And we'll always have temptations to put him second, third, fourth, or even last. The Lord says, put me first. So what I want to say to you is the next time you hear uh, the word first, pause, pause and think about it. When someone says, well, first, I want you to do this. Well, pause and make sure it's a good deal because first things must always come first. At the end of the day, it's all about choices and priorities, isn't it? Choices have to do with priorities and we have a choice how we spend our time, how we spend our money, how we even spend our relationships. Firstness, choices are about priorities. Is your marriage a priority? Is time with your children a priority? Is studying in school, preparing for school, preparing for college, preparing for high school or middle school, as that time is coming before us, is it a priority? Is becoming debt free a priority? Is time with important friends a priority? Is time with God? A priority? Is your, emo- is your emotional and your mental health a priority? Listen, friends, don't give up on your priorities. Don't give up on your position of integrity. Don't give up your integrity for something lesser or of temporal value. Don't allow your appetite to rob you of your birthright. Maybe you ought to just write that down. Get a three by five card. Do we still have those? You know what those are? Get a post-it note. You know what that is? Send a text to yourself. Write it in the chat. Don't allow your appetite to rob you of your birthright. Text it to yourself. Tweet it. Create a meme. Don't allow your appetite to rob you of your birthright. And we all have appetites, don't we? Physical, sexual, powerful, positional, popularity, fame, money. Can I ask you, what appetites or or habits 
have the strongest pull in your life? I know mine. Do you know yours? You know, in Hebrews 12, it says, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles or, as the King James says, besets us. Do you have a besetting sin? A habitual vice that hinders you from your rightful place? Many of you have temptations. I'm no different. The rest of humanity is no different. First Corinthians 10, 13 tells us there's no temptation that has besieged you except that which is common to man. But God is faithful in that he always presents a door or, or a way out. But none of the temptations that you have are, are uncommon to man. The devil just wants to make you think that yours is so unique. Yours is so unique. You have a special situation. No, it ain't special. It's the same old thing the enemy's been doing for a long time. And your habits and your addictions and vices and proclivities and tendencies that easily beset you are right there. And it's not that they're all bad. It's that they have to be managed. Esau wasn't in sin because he was hungry. In fact, I would say the greater sin was Jacob because he planned the whole event as the deceiver. Who do you think was more in line with the devil, Esau or Jacob? And we're going to talk about Jacob and Esau being blessed, but sometimes we make heroes of those who are actually doing the worst, not the best. Why does God do that? Why does God use people like a Jacob in his line, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, and so on? Actually, Jacob was the bad person in the story. But Esau fell for it. He had an appetite. That appetite was natural. That appetite was human. But even natural and human appetites can lead us into difficulty, challenges, and trouble. That's why I want you to remember the point of the sermon if you remember nothing else. Don't allow your appetite to rob you of your birthright. Esau's hunger was stronger than his desire to hold on to his position. And when he quickly evaluated his birthright, which is really of great value, he traded it in for something of lesser value. Had Esau held on and maybe said, let me talk to mom and dad first, what would have happened? If Esau would have held on and negotiated harder with his brother, what do you think would have happened? Had he prayed for greater strength in that moment to resist his urges, what would you think would have happened? We don't know because Esau didn't hold on, but you and I can. Philippians 4.13 says that I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. So what have we learned so far? We said there are going to be three life lessons, right? Well, I've given you two. I'll move to the third one, but let's review the two. Beware of the weasels in your way. Be fiercely committed to what's first. And here's the third and final life lesson for today. Bring your appetites under the control of the Holy Spirit. Pastor saying he's taught about the Holy Spirit. He's there to help us when we need him. He's known as the helper. We see evidence of this even in Jesus' life when he was in the desert in Matthew chapter 4. The enemy tried to tempt him because he had a hunger too. He had been for 40 days and 40 nights fasting. Can you imagine how hungry he was? Can you imagine how thirsty he was? Can you imagine how famished Jesus was? And yet it tells us in 1 John chapter 2, verse 16, for everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life come not, comes not from the Father, but from the world. In other words, the enemy, when he's using the world system in order to tempt us, he has three levels of attack. The, law, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Of life. He used this same attack against the first Adam. Remember Adam and Eve? The first Adam looked at the fruit. He took hold of it and he ate it. Jesus is known as the second Adam. And now he has this opportunity to just go ahead and make food for himself. But he doesn't give in. But the enemy still throws that same level of attack in those three areas as he did with the first Adam. And he tried it on Jesus, but it failed. 
He went after the flesh and the eyes and the pride of life. It worked on Adam and Eve. It worked on Esau. And it can work on us unless we put our appetites under the control of the Holy Spirit. What would have happened if Esau would have called on the Holy Spirit to help him? Scripture tells us that the Holy Spirit will help us. And when you get to Matthew chapter 4, and you can read it on your own sometime, I won't go through all of it, but the devil tempts Jesus when he is hungry and out in the wilderness. In the first temptation, the devil appeals to Jesus' flesh. He says, hey, if you're the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Man, you know what that sounds like to me? What it sounds like to me is really yummy. You have the ability to turn stones into bread? Can I make it a pepperoni pizza from Lido's? Okay. But Jesus answered, it is written, man does not live on bread alone or pizza alone, but if I could, I'd try. But on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Jesus uses the word of God, quoting Deuteronomy. So then the devil comes at him the second way, not only against the flesh, but now what about your pride? And the devil says in Matthew 4, 5 and 6, then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, appealing to his pride, throw yourself down. Jesus says, for it is written, I mean, the, 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 the devil quotes scripture, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you and they will lift you up in, in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. He's quoting Psalm 91 and the devil knows the word of God. And the first Adam gave in and said, that's a good deal. I'm taking it. Esau, that's a deal. I'm taking it. But Jesus negotiates a, a rebuttal, a banter back. And he says, it is written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Jesus did not accept a shortcut to the crown. He was willing to go through the hard work and not weasel his way to glory. The devil tries one more time and he goes after Jesus' eyes. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms, showed him, look. Look, all the kingdoms of the world. He's like a salesman saying, if you can visualize yourself in this car, you can afford it. Devil takes him to this high place, shows him all the, the kingdoms of the world and all of its splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you just bow down and worship me. Jesus quotes the word again. He says, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. The devil showed him everything. Jesus had everything in front of him. He could have at any time given into his flesh, his eyes, or the pride of life, but he said no because we were worth it. He knew that if he gave in and got the crown without going through the cross, he would not get us condemned sinners. And because he saw you for the joy, he endured the cross knowing that he would gain you and gain me. In other words, someone said it like this, in order to say no to a burning desire, you have to have a deeper yes within. It's not easy to say no. Jesus said no to Satan because he was saying yes to us. He was saying yes to the Father. Can I ask you, what is your deeper burning yes within? To hold on to the priorities and the royalty of your birthright. Are you willing to exchange your priorities for a lesser bowl of soup? You may be hungry or as thirsty as a divorced and widowed single man or woman, but do you have a deeper burning desire to resist the sex culture that besets us day in and day out? You may be a hungry, thirsty spouse for emotional and sexual attention from your Loved one, and you're looking outside your marriage, are you willing to take in a bowl of soup with an affair or watching porn to satisfy the priorities of your flesh over your vows? You may be hungry and, and thirsty for a promotion or a position at work and a business opportunity or financial deal could come set you up for life. But are you willing to give up that position of integrity that you have in order to cut 
an unethical deal. What are your priorities, children of God? To seek God and his righteousness or to give up your birthright for a bowl of temporary, satisfying soup? Well, I tell you, this is not an easy message for me to preach. I promise you that I have had my share of Esau moments. Oh, yeah. I saw Esau. <laughs> I saw Esau in myself. I saw Esau in my ministry. I saw Esau in my marriage. I saw Esau in my money. I saw Esau in Miami last week in the airport. Esau is that dirty, hairy inside of all of us that's rough around the edges, hardworking and yet hungry and thirsty and passionate, yet vulnerable and on the edge of losing everything important over what is expedient and temporarily satisfying. And that dirty, hairy was sitting at the end of the bar. And I'm like, it's, but there's a cheeseburger right there. You can see it. You can smell it. And it's right in front of you. So you, you want to hear what I did in the airport? When I had that choice, a burger or a chicken sandwich, brioche roll, with all the fixings, I hadn't had a burger in four or five months. What did I do? I ordered the chicken sandwich after I ate the burger. That's what I did. That's right. Man, I ate two sandwiches, both of them, not both of them, both of them. Man, it was dripping all through my hands. I was biting it. I almost forgot how to eat a burger. You know how you eat a burger, right? You take that first bite, and now it has two corners. Which one are you going to eat first, this one or that one? And then you bite the corner, and now there's another little knobby sticking out. You bite that one. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Like the tomatoes and the, and the ketchup, mustard, mayo, all of it, right? And they brought some chips on the side. And so I'm eating the burger after eating the chicken sandwich and now eating the chips. Mm, I saw Esau. <laughs> I failed. Oh, but it was so good. I can only imagine how that soup tasted for Esau. The problem is what happens afterwards. It says in verse 34, then Jacob gave Esau some bread and some lentil stew. He ate it and drank it, and then he got up and left. So Esau despised his birthright. The very thing you cherish now becomes the very thing you despise because you didn't properly value it. The contemporary English version puts it like this. And when Esau had finished eating and drinking, he just got up and left, showing how little he thought of his rights as the firstborn. You see, sometimes you don't see the value of something until you've lost it. Now, my consequences weren't that dire, so it was not that big of a deal. It was just, you know, eating a burger, and I'm glad I did because... Look what they gave me on the plane, mini pretzels. It was a good decision. I didn't make any vow like, you know, well, I'm going to go to hell if I eat a burger. No, I ate both, both sandwiches, and it was really, really good. And it sustained me all the way until I was getting home like six hours later. And then even after that, I got some Chinese food. But that's a different story. Okay, so here, what's the point? The point is simply this. What did we learn today? We've learned three lessons, and I want you to repeat it after me, okay? The first one. Beware of weasels in your way. Number two, be fiercely committed to what's first. Thirdly, bring your appetites under the control of the Holy Spirit. As I bring my message to a conclusion, let me give a personal word of encouragement. I've given examples of really small temptations when it comes to burgers and fries or chips and things of that sort. I know they're much bigger ones for you, for me. And some of you are saying right now, I saw you saw. You may be staring at a bowl of temporary, tempting soup right now on your job, in your home, on your computer screen, on your phone. You may be choosing between an unsatisfying existence with many pretzels 
in a temporarily satisfying, juicy cheeseburger right at your fingertips. But you need to take your cues from Jesus, not from me. He repeated God's word out loud. He resisted the devil, and it says that the devil would f fled from him. And he received the ministry of the angels afterwards. When you resist the devil and finally he flees from you, the Spirit of God will minister to you, not only while you're doing it, but even afterwards. It says in Matthew 4, 11, then the devil left him and the angels came and attended him. When Esau was done eating, he got up and left and despised his birthright. When Adam was done eating the fruit, he and Eve were kicked out of the garden. But when Jesus stood against temptation, the devil left him. And the angel swooped in and ministered to him. I want to encourage you that you can do all things through Christ who gives you strength. And the way I'm going to end today's message is with a declaration from Ephesians 6. Receive this. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand, stand firm then. Amen and amen.